Somebody else is later. Okay, uh, let's start. So this is a presentation by students uh, at the Combion Confidence Center for Data Engineering Sciences. It's a half thesis report of four presentations. And the first one is on GDOT. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Mustakim and my teammate Yasir. Today we're going to talk about the global database of events, language and tone, which is GDEL. Uh, so what is GDEL? GDEL is a global database of society which is supported by uh, Google Jigsaw and this project has been going on since 1979. So what it does basically, it monitors the world's news media from nearly every part of every country of the world uh, in print, broadcast, web formats, and then it identifies people, location, organizations, events, themes, images, crowns, quotes, etc. And GDL has like a sentiment analysis with more than uh, 2,300 emotions and themes. And also it can be accessed over more than 65 languages. Next slide. Okay, so um, in our data set, we're using uh, three different tables. We have GKG, which is global knowledge graph. We have events table, and then we have mentions. So basically what, um, what we have find from GKG is GKG represents articles where also we can find like uh, information about article uh, shores, shores URL, translation, GCAM. And what GCAM is, GCAM is global content analysis measure on each document. And also we can find like um, geolocation information from this table. And then we have like events. So events, we can see like we have two actors um, and on what each action is for like two actors or sometimes it can be done by one actor as well. And also from um, events, we can also um, find information about the actors can, like uh, their name, country, ethnicity, religion. And here, if we give, if you try to give an example, like uh, President Reagan has threatened further program uh, being by satellite here, that news. So if we try to say like here, actors are President Reagan, and um, um, and here that whole action, it's uh, like so that he's he threatened the whole um, the program being by satellite. So here, President Reagan will be the actor in our uh, table, and then the whole and the whole uh, his uh, activity will be the action for this. And um, from then we have like our mention table. In our mention table, we can find like how many times an event were mentioned in different types of um, articles. And also we can find like how confident the um, GDL parsing is from this table. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. And GDL uses the CAMU codes to represent information for actors and actions. For actions specifically, you can visualize it as a tree where when you go down levels, you add more context to the action. So for instance, as you can see, we have investigate as an action and you can have a G dot could or could not add, uh, get these contexts, which be uh, investigation for a crime or a corruption. And for, and for our experiments, we only included the Swedish media, and in other words, all the documents that in Swedish and all the events that's happening in Sweden for 2021. We also included only the actions that have a gold, a gold stand score below zero. The gold stand score uh, is the representation of how the theoret theoretical impact of an action in the, in the society. So for instance, the previous example of the threatening would have a negative score, uh, where on the other side, uh, like let's say Swedish uh, winning the Olympics would have a positive score. And here you will see a tree map of um, the taxonomy of the actions. So here I say we have a, how many uh, times um, an event for invest investigation or fight has been mentioned. And for tone, and the color is, is represents the tone, as in uh, how impactful the, the text was, emotionally impactful. And, uh, and this one is for the time series for all the uh, events in Sweden. And in the blue, you see the number of mentions for um, the actions that we were that we already talked about, and, uh, and the, the red, the average. Uh, Goldstein's gold score. 
And lastly, but not least, we represent these action, uh, these uh, actions in a, a geomap where the, the size of the bubble represents how many times this location was mentioned, and the color represents the average Goldstein gold score. And uh, as you can see, Stockholm and Gothen Gothenburg seems to have the most uh, pop popularity during this year. And with this, we end our presentation. Okay, so uh, let's have the next uh, next team. Yes, I'll face this way since these guys already know what I'm doing. Um, so I have, uh, for my fellowship, I've dabbled with some uh, sentiment analysis using lexicons. Next slide, slide please. This is Matthias Minard. Yeah, this is Matthias Minard. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. We have slide. Yes, good. Uh, so, um, so what is sentiment analysis, just to, for, for those of you who don't know? Uh, well, uh, you can say that it's a way of mining some emotion from a text. Um, I did this on tweets, so uh, in, in my case, it was simply tweets that, that we mine emotions from. And why is this useful then? Well, uh, let's say you're a company and you release a product and you want to know how the product is received from, from your, your customers. Then maybe you can run some sentiment analysis on tweets uh, to see what people think of the product. Uh, so yes, uh, next slide, please. Good. Uh, so uh, I'm just gonna uh, walk you through uh, a bit of what I've done so far. Um, um, so these are the three points that I will, I will go through and the first two will be quite brief. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, in the start of any, any data science project, you need data. And for me, it was already, already um, um, fetched and uh, uh, processed and stuff like that. Uh, in a nice delta lake, lake, which I got access to. So I didn't have to do anything on streaming or anything like that, which was nice for me, uh, simple. Uh, but, uh, and, and the tweets, uh, which I got to use for tweets uh, related to different companies. Um, but uh, you can use any, any text or tweet if you want to. Uh, so yeah, next is fine. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I still had to do some type of pre-processing because uh, tweets are very, very casual texts and you still need to like remove uh, hashtags and, and the different type of signs and stuff like that. And, and uh, uh, maybe some stock word removal because there's a lot of like texts which are not in these lexicons which I used, which I will talk about now. Um, so I used uh, two lexicons and what these lexicon are is they, that they map uh, each word to, uh, or words to an emotion. Uh, and I use two different lexicons. One is from Språkbanken, uh, which is a, uh, just each word just has a simple positive or negative uh, sentiment related to it. Uh, and then I use the more uh, complex one, I guess you could say, uh, which is uh, from or based on LIWC, which is a sentiment analysis tool. And that had some 72 categories in it. Um, so uh, the Sprock Banken looks uh, like this, very, very simple. So you have a word and then you have a uh, polarity, is it positive or negative, and then strength of that polarity. Uh, very, very simple stuff. Uh, and the next lexicon uh, is, yeah, from LIWC, and it's, it's a bit more complex. Since you have, uh, you can see here in the right table, there are a bunch of categories and there are set two of them. And then in the left table, you have uh, words and uh, a list of categories these words are correlated to. So how do you go ahead and use these then? Uh, well, uh, the procedure is quite simple. Uh, you break the text into just uh, word chunks, and then you get a sentiment for each word, and then you try to average uh, each of these words based on the text. And this is the very, very simple one. Uh, it's a very, very simple workflow uh, for uh, each tweet. Um, but you can do this as, at a larger, uh, larger scale as well if you uh, collect tweets into corpuses and stuff like that. Uh, but and I wanted to have some some form of um, uh, visualization to show you, but I didn't quite get there. So I borrowed this from Cosens, which is a, a project which this project is based upon. Uh, so so here is uh, you get an idea of, of, of what you could do with, with sentiment analysis. So here you have a, a, a couple of these uh, types of categories. Uh, which you could find in LIWC. Uh, and these are related to disease. And then you can see here, like each day, how people tweeted to uh, tweet about, uh, or, or how, how different tweets during a day related to 
uh, some one of these categories. So that is what I have to show you. Thank you. Yeah, and a quick plug. Although we've done very elementary uh, lexicon-based analysis, uh, if you have a hundred parameter model, GPT-3 for the train with the Swedish transport function using the Brazilian supercomputer, it's simply a different transform one can add to this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Mr. Failia, and me and my teammate Virginia over here, we're going to talk about binary trend calculus and causal inference, inference using the library pathogen. And we're also going to go through a showcase of gold versus oil price. But first, we need to give a brief presentation of the trend calculus algorithms, and we're going to start with some definitions. So formally, a trend is defined as rising if it has higher highs and higher lows, and falling if it has lower highs and lower lows. We can also quantify this definition by assigning the values plus one and minus one for rising and falling trends, respectively. So here in this slide, you can uh, see what we mean with these higher highs and higher lows. So the basic steps of uh, the algorithm are as follows. First, you want to stream the data across a fixed window size. And then for each of these windows, you want to identify a dated high and low. Then a summary is, uh, arrive, arrives for each window based on the occurrence of the lie, the low and the high. And then lastly, we compare the summary of the current window to the previous one. The next step is to assign a sign for each window. And we do that by using the trend calculus equations in here. So given this equation, we assign a sign for each window. So naturally, we come to the definition of a reversal point, which is a point on the previous window where the trend values split. So in order to identify these points, we're using uh, two rules. Basically, if the trend moves from rising to falling, the reversal is the previous high. And for the other way around, the reversal is the previous low. And here's a simple example that we can see that. So now the output of the algorithm is a new time series that includes just the reversal point. So now we can use this time series of trend change points iteratively in order to establish long-term trends of streams. This uh, algorithm is very efficient due to the data reduction that uh, is being done in every iteration. And uh, we're going to go through a showcase now. Uh, generally speaking, uh, oil is uh, considered by the scientific community and specifically in the economic uh, journal. It was published that oil prices can lead to inflation. At the same time, gold has been the most effective uh, safe haven in most countries and by investors it is used again as a hedge against inflation so the natural question that arises is if a change in oil price can be a predictor of changing gold although the over the long term gold prices tend to move up and down in tandem with oil prices so here we have a visualization of the two, the two time series. And uh, we can see this tandem movement among the two. So the next step is to try to connect the output of trend calculus as input pathogen and see if this intuition that we have about golden oil can be captured through pathogen. So Virginia is going to talk about that. Yeah, the pathogen algorithm uses the graphics uh, library to find causal inference between time-related events. So taking events, it observes a causation signal on time-related events uh, by generating random correlations. Uh, then it outputs the causal effects found as a graph. And um, it uses this graph to extract the most probable causes and effects uh, by returning a new graph with two measures. The first one is called aggressiveness, and it measures how likely an event 
could explain downstream uh, effects, or in other words, if an event causes other events. And the second one is called sensitivity, and it measures uh, how likely an event results from an uh, upstream event cause, or in other words, if an event is caused by other events. So now, as uh, Rafaela mentioned, we have uh, the output from the Trend Calculus uh, Library, which is a time series of uh, reversal points. And for the pathogen, we want uh, the input needs to be an event. So we need to convert this output from Trend Calculus to an event. Then in this case, an event is going to be the occurrence of consecutive reversal points for a specific order. Uh, to know if, uh, to, if the events obtained from the two time series are comparable, if we can compare them, the Kolmogorov uh, Smirov test is used so we can identify pairs of orders from the two time series for which the time frames are uh, similar. And the next question that we want to continue studying now is if pathogen will capture these uh, effects that we have observed in the, in the plot. Thank you. Um, I guess I should qualify that if you want to understand uh, what pathogen is, uh, and uh, it's, it's actually my research, so you're welcome to, to help us go understand this. Uh, you can start by watching Antoine's video from, uh, was it four weeks ago, yeah. and then uh, the follow video. Um, so basically the reason we jumped on this instead of starting with some mathematical model is to actually take a model that won a big data championship because it, it uses scalable uh, uh, algorithms so that we can actually take, take you know, time series up to even second level resolution of financial trends of thousands of time series potentially, and then have a formal way of possibly understanding cause and effect. Um, so let us move to the next speaker. Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Sukhara Chan. Today I'm going to present my project in the topic of lock-in tree. Actually, we start this project with a notion that there is a problem called when they're locked in in the data science industry. By the term when they're locked in, it just simply means a situation where users are too dependent on a single specific vendors. For example, in the data science industry, some students, some scientists may have a chance to work just only on some notebook platform like Databrick and on AWS or on just only on GCP. And they just have a chance to work on that and they keep building things up over there. They keep adding more functions and features, data sets, and generate the, the result out of it. And after for a while, they might need to migrate things from one platform to the other platform. And they might find it hard to do that. It is because um, there might be some technical incompatibilities or some illegal issues, or it just simply is like um, some features and functions are native to just only on AWS or Databricks, so it cannot run somewhere else. So in order to tackle this vendor lock-in problem, we need to have some kind of infrastructures that we call lock-in free. And we need two things in these infrastructures. The first one, we need to have a tool to convert notebook between different formats. And the second thing that we need to have is the multi-cloud providers like AWS, GCP, Microsoft Azure, and in order to achieve this, we will take this approach, infrastructure as code or IAC. And we use Terraform in order to achieve the IAC things. And as the name suggests, infrastructure as code. That means we just simply define anything we want in the infrastructures like um, many instances that we need, the type of the instances, type of the 
uh, the, the, the storage, SSD, or magnetic, and how much do we need? The security group, firewall, routing table, services, applications, everything that we need in a code. And it's just simply like a text, right? Code is a text. So it is simply like that. And when we have a Terraform code, the users or scientists or students who want to work on AWS or GCP, the only thing that they have to do is that they just run just a, a few commands like Terraform in it, plan and apply to trigger this code to run. And this code will just initialize everything on AWS or on GCP for us. And in some use cases, like some students may have a free credits on AWS and some free credits on GCP too. So they decided they want to start working on AWS first and when the credits is running out, so they have to migrate it to <laughs> GCP, right? Okay, so they have to destroy all the infrastructures on AWS. So again, they just use a few commands to rough up destroy, to destroy everything so that the charge will not be injured after that. And then again, they just use a few commands to run the code to initialize all the infrastructures on the GCP. And so for, they can continue doing their homework problems? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, that's right, <laughs> yes. Okay, and what we have right now is that we have the the tool to convert notebooks between different formats. And we have a Terraform code to implement the infrastructures on AWS and GCP. Okay, and that's, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Okay, I think that's uh, that's the end of the sort of formal round of presentations. I, I mean, we have 20, 30 more minutes. So if people want to ask questions uh, about uh, anything, uh, especially, you know, if the Urban Lab people are here, uh, it would be great to get more feedback for you guys, right? Um, so that uh, they can, I think, yeah, I think the GDO team is working on uh, uh, gun violence and gang shootings and things like this in, reported in Swedish uh, media, mass media. And, uh, you know, so they can actually provide the output from their project so that it may be useful for the urban lab researchers. Um, so there, I think uh, it will be great to get some feedback and, and more generally any, any other feedback as well. Uh, we can also stop recording if people don't want to go on YouTube to all these questions. <laughs> so I mainly want to record the formal part because a lot of people from uh, both academia and, 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 and corporations and a couple of time zones couldn't come. So let me stop the recording. Um,